Hello. Today I chat with Saloni Datani, who is this amazing pluralist researcher across our world in data and works in progress and Stripe Press. And she is, you know, we chat about her kind of view on the world and both the movements that she tracks, effective altruism, progress studies, etc., and also kind of how she goes about her research process. And it's just really cool to see how focused she is on science communication and how to make science communication better. So if you want to learn about these movements and how they especially relate to and can be like popularized with the general public, especially around science communication, check it out. It's a great episode. Thanks. Hello, fellow pluralists. I'm Reese, the co-founder of Root, and welcome to The Reese Show. This century is a turning point in human history, and I'm here to help you navigate it. I hope you come away with a new understanding of the te scientific, technological, and societal trends that are poised to radically reshape our world, and how you can work with those trends to become a live player in building a solar punk future. And today, I'm excited to chat with a live player who is building a solar punk future right now, uh, Saloni Datani. Saloni is associated with a set of awesome orgs. She's an editor at Stripe Press, a founder and editor at Works in Progress, a researcher at Our World and Data, and she's also uh, doing a PhD. She's a PhD student in psych psychiatric genetics at King's College London and the University of Hong Kong. Saloni, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to dive in. And it's, I, I think that, you know, as to kind of upload it into our brains for a second. I think the goal, as we chatted about before, is like to get the listeners to really understand like how you how you kind of work and across all these different kind of fields and see these different sub movements and do the research on them. And then also kind of to understand what leverage points you're starting to see within those sub communities or within that kind of research um, research sphere. So with mm -hmm. that though, I actually want to ask you a question, which is I think you're into a bunch of cool, awesome things. And I'm curious for you, like, what was the catalyzing moment in your childhood <laughs> that kind of kicked off a feedback loop that made you curious and excited and motivated to learn? That's a great question. Um, I, I think there isn't probably a single moment, but I, I think when I was at school, I realized I just enjoyed everything I was studying. So I enjoyed history, French, uh, economics, um, geography, English, science. Whatever. And I had no idea what I wanted to do for a career. Um, I thought about doing lots of different things. I wanted to write novels at one point. I wanted to be a spy, like in a James Bond movie or something like that. Um, eventually, I kind of settled on biology just because it was so expansive. And I thought, there's no way I'm going to get bored of learning about this. And there's just so much out there that I won't have to pick a particular topic until much later. Um, so I guess I kind of left my options open. And even though I did kind of go into a very specific field um, from there, I've still been interested in lots of different things, even in the meantime. And that's, I guess, just stayed with me. So I've, I just enjoy doing lots of different things and seeing the connections between them. I love that. Yeah, I think it's and it's cool that you like had this experience in school where you're like, oh, man, I love this and I love this. I love French. I love whatever. And then um, and it's cool that even when you love all those things, you can both pick a field, biology, and then pick a super subfield, psychiatric um, genetics, right. and, and go deep on that while also still thinking about works in progress and progress studies and all that. So but let me actually I'm going to push you a bit on this. So like, can you mm -hmm. think of like go deeper into your it doesn't need to be a full therapy <laughs> session, but like deeper in your childhood, like what? When you were 10 or when you were like, what was making, were you always just this curious about the world or was it your parents somehow or was like a teacher? Well, yeah. Um, I would say it was that I just, I enjoyed reading books. I didn't, I enjoyed kind of things from school. I wasn't very good at sports and I thought school seems like something I'm good at. I like reading um, and I just pick out anything from the library and just kind of sit and read um, on the bus at dinner, it was quite rude, I think, um, to read like when I was sitting at the dinner table with my parents, um, various things like that. And I'd read books like um, there is this horrible sciences book. I don't know if you've read that series. Yeah. It's kind of like horrible histories, but the science version. Um, and they had this book called Evolve or Die, which was about uh, natural selection and evolution and how Charles Darwin kind of put together all the pieces 
um, in his book. And I think that's that's probably the most influential book I can remember reading. Um, that got me really interested in um, biology and evolution, and I think it kind of spiraled from there. Yeah, I love that. I think there's a like there's something so crazy about well, a it's cool that yeah you were really into reading. I I, I remember for myself I they had these like reading battles i was born and raised in america where it's like oh can you read more than a million words and it was me versus these two other women and then this but this woman um she was just so much she was like maybe closer to you where she was reading all the time and i was like i would like reading but like i had sports in random and but she was just mm -hmm. beast in it so i she read like six million and i read like you know two million or whatever so it's like i can't catch up um <laughs> the other thing the evolutionary lens i think is really wow, what an amazing kind of intellectual nugget to kind of dive in on and be like, whoa, that's really interesting. I, I want to maybe ask you about that from both maybe a biological perspective and a genetic perspective, but also maybe a mimetic perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I guess maybe from a, let's go from the mimetic perspective. You know, you are into a bunch of these um, sub-communities of rationalism, effective altruism, progress studies, et cetera. How, how do you see those... Um, entities in a, or like, what do you think about the meme perspective generally from evolution, and how do you see these like different sub movements interacting in their mimetic niches and competing in, or collaborating? Uh, oh, I haven't. I feel like I haven't thought about that at all. Um, sort of the idea of memes being evolving kind of concepts, but I I think what's really nice about all of these different movements is that you can kind of learn from each of them and connect different dots from each other without necessarily going very deep into any of them. So I, I don't, I would say I'm probably not involved in any of them, but I also have absorbed various things from all of them. Um, and that I think is maybe a great example of the kind of meme culture that that, that has. So a lot of um, phrases and concepts from each of those are very wide, widely known now. Um, among my friends and people online. And that's not because people are reading these long form blogs or books by the people involved in the community. It's just because these terms are just really useful ways of describing things that everyone knows about. Yeah. Do you think maybe uh, just to vibe for a second on that, is there, well, I love the idea of, and it's like a pluralistic perspective where it's like, and I kind of wrote, mostly agree with you. I'm not, I wouldn't define myself as an effective altruist, but like, yeah, I'm EA adjacent or whatever. And there's like, mm -hmm. but I think that, um, you know, maybe like what, one of those like, like little phrases might be, I mean, uh, you know, a classic one is just like uh, subsidizing um, demand versus, uh, you know, expanding supply or whatever is like a progress studies adjacent abundance economy one. Is there any other like, recent uh like mimetic phrases that come to your mind from any of these sub communities um so there's there's definitely lots that i feel seem really obvious now or like you almost don't even associate them with those communities just because they're so widespread so in group and out group for example i think those those are good ones um there's some new ones i, I really like this uh phrase of um a team is mindset i don't know if you've heard of that um, yeah, but explain it for was, our listeners. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the team's mindset is this idea that things are just inherently difficult to solve or like that they just any challenges that exist just can't be overcome and you should just kind of give up. Um, and then there's the opposite view of the like anti teams mindset where you try to do things that are big and ambitious, even if they might not work out. Um, and it derives from the internet meme of uh, the doge, or well, doggy, I guess. Um, so there's that meme of this very muscular dog that's called a swole doge, and then there's the very weak dog that's crying beside it called the cheem's doge. Yeah, exactly. I think it's like you have the cheem, who's the weak doge, and you're just like the cheem's mindset. It's just like... Well, the world is what it is. Like, I guess we're not going to beat climate change. We should all just be sad about it, you know, um, versus right. the anti team mindset or whatever. It's just like, no, 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 no. Reject that. Like, we can actually do something about it, people. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I love that one. I think it is funny how these things are connected. There's the visual 
there's like the actual there's memes in the Dawkins sense and then there's like internet memes and in like in this in this sense and I think it is cool to have like the language can percolate can start on the internet with images like this and can percolate into actual like words and, and vocal stuff mm-hmm. um yeah that's and it's interesting too because I've, I've been doing some like I don't know memetic analysis of these internet memes and there are a couple um memes that all take the form of this um the like cheem doge thing where it's like the strong versus weak versions of stuff there's like there's also the um the bell curve one where you have like the total unwoke person the like middle person and then like the super woke person and the total unwoke plus the super woke are like they come to the same thing of like learning is good Mm -hmm. or so i don't know you know um so that's kind of interesting do you want to tell us more away from these like mimetic groups and and towards maybe some of the specific things that you're working on i guess the first thing i want to check in is you do all this amazing writing and editing and curation but you also just started your own newsletter tell us what is what's the deal with it <laughs> what's the deal with the newsletter or i'm sorry sorry what, tell us, what you, tell us what you wrote about tell us what what is the goal of your newsletter and um okay, what's the sure. first post on you did today so so this this is a new newsletter um i just launched today called scientific discovery um and the broad kind of aim of this newsletter is just to share really good research or just research in the news put into context so general person can keep up with what's happening in the scientific world without necessarily being on twitter 24 7. Um, I think like there's so much going on that people don't really hear about. And there's also lots of, um, I think often things that do come up in the news tend to be flashy or hyped, hyped up uh, studies that are not very good quality. Um, And I kind of want to reverse that trend of not exactly criticizing papers or just sort of sharing why some studies are bad, but I want to share research that's actually good or just put things in context so that people understand that there's lots of great stuff going on out there. Yeah, I think that's cool. I think I'm just looking at this first one. Um, yeah, so the, the news is called Scientific Discovery and yeah, great new scientific research condensed. Um, it's fun because like, yeah, it's a thing that you're probably just naturally doing yourself. And so you just kind of like let open source this to the fans. Um, first one is this, these first working vaccines against respiratory syn, 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 How do you say that? <laughs> Second word. Uh, it's respiratory syncytial virus. Syncytial virus. Okay. Um, and I guess we have a new vaccine against it. Is that true? against RSV? Yeah, it's yeah, it's amazing. So this is so respiratory syncytial virus or RSV is a uh, virus that causes uh, respiratory disease usually in infants and the elderly. Um, it causes kind of global pandemics almost every year um, and it's very devastating in many poor countries. It causes I think 6% of um, childhood deaths worldwide. And in the U.S., sorry, childhood deaths from respiratory diseases worldwide. And um, in the U.S., it causes half of childhood hospitalizations. Um, And the reason for that difference is that in the U.S., a lot of the other diseases that are preventable are much um, less common, whereas RSV has not been preventable for a very, very long time. Um, So people have been looking for a vaccine for this disease for decades since around the 60s um, and it's just been very difficult to find one that actually works some of the earlier ones kind of didn't work and they also made things worse in trials so um, what happened was these uh, these older vaccines would make people more susceptible to the disease when they actually got infected um, and these new studies have the opposite finding where these new vaccines are like very effective. Um, and the reason for that is something that I describe in my newsletter. I don't know if I should just leave that as a mystery for people to read about Ooh. or describe it. <laughs> Let's know. I would love to hear it. What, what, how did they, what's that? Okay, what they, sure. what was the secret, the secret? So, so the secret is also a secret with the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so what happens with this virus is, that it has uh, proteins on its shell, and these proteins kind of they fuse with your body cells and then allow the virus to enter your cells. 
Um, but when they fuse with your cells, they then change their shape. And that means that um, if you design a vaccine, you have to pick the right shape to use. So if you pick the shape that those proteins have before they enter cells, that means that your body will learn how this how this virus looks before it enters cells and will be able to block it much better. Um, but until now, it was very difficult for researchers to know what that pre-fusion version of the protein looked like, and it was difficult for them to know how to create a vaccine that looked like that pre-fusion version. Um, so this, there's been new research in the last um, seven or eight years uh, tr that has figured out what that pre-fusion protein looks like and then how to recreate it in a lab. Um, and that's led to several vaccine manufacturers using that kind of um, vaccine in their own formulations. And so we now have uh, one vaccine that's kind of shown efficacy in phase three trials by GSK. And then there are a few more that are coming um, that seem to be effective in earlier trials as well. Cool. Yeah. So it's like, I guess it's, there's a, well, it's a, it's interesting that RSV is uh 50% of respiratory hospital or of, of all childhood hospitalizations in the U S and then 6% of respiratory deaths in the world. Um, because other folks in the world are dying from stuff like, um, you know, uh, malaria and diarrhea and things like that. Um, and so that makes sense. And then it's, uh, and it makes it also more like a classic, like, oh, then the rich people are interested in it because like their kids are, you know, like <laughs> dying or whatever, or get, getting hospitalized. And then for this one specifically, it's like, okay, cool. They are, they have found this protein and they're trying to, they can now do a better job of understanding what it looks like before it actually attacks us or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, my 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 yeah. very weak version of your synthesis, you know. No, but that's exactly right. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's an amazing thing because so as I said, the same thing was really important with the COVID nineteen vaccine. So COVID nineteen also has a spike protein, which looks different before and after it enters your cells, and depending on which um, type of protein people included in the vaccine, they had very different um, levels of efficacy. So. The mRNA vaccines, for example, use this pre-fusion um, protein, so they are much more effective than some of the other ones that didn't that failed the trials earlier. That's last cool. Year. That's interesting. I wasn't aware that there's that that mRNA. I know they like mRNA prints out these like um, spike proteins or whatever and says, "Hey, here's what we're printing. We're moving, you know using our ribosomes to print stuff." And then um, and then oh, go attack it. But I didn't know what it was printing was the actual. Mm -hmm the pre-fusion spike protein versus some of these other vaccines, what they do maybe, and you, is that they, uh, they allow the stuff to get in there initially. And then they give a little bit of the vac. They actually put the virus in there or something. And then it learns what it looks like, but it kind of learns what it looks like after it's already attacked. And so it's less yeah. good at hitting it. Huh. Yeah, um, exactly. wow. That's, that's interesting. Well, I'm excited for, it reminds me of, you know, there's just like a site shortscience.org which is, to me seems related. There's just like this ability for folks like you who are um, in deep to kind of outsource and say, hey, here's some cool stuff that I'm learning about. Here's the quick TLDR of it. It's kind of like how you absorb things from other communities by these kind of like short snippets. You're kind of doing that um, for your own world. So that is cool. Tell me more about, I guess for you though, you have this kind of, I want to understand more about like how you see the world. <laughs> um, what I mean by that is, you have the our world and data perspective. You have the works in progress, like progress studies perspective. You have the kind of Stripe Press perspective. Um, and then you have this deep biology perspective. You're going through stuff. Are you just kind of following your curiosity? Are you looking for like impactful things? What 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 brings you into research spaces and how do you go about it? Um, hmm. Uh, also a great question. So I think... Um... I have no idea how to answer that, but I, I will say that I um, I had no like ambition to go into any of these things in particular, and they kind of just happened. So, yeah. for example, works in progress uh, was just this thing that I discussed with my friend Sam Bowman. Uh, we both had different interests or like different motivations to start the magazine. So, um, like with this newsletter, I was kind of frustrated by the way lots of science was reported in the news. I felt like it was often very shallow or sometimes would just hype out, hype up um, 
really poor quality or small studies. And I kind of wanted to showcase interesting research by people who really knew what they were talking about and written in a lot more depth. So that's that's something that I think is really useful about the works in progress and, and that we care a lot about getting the details right and having kind of lengthy but very accessible explanations of things. Um, but again, this was like, this had been a side project for two years almost before we joined Stripe. Um, and I never imagined that it could last more than a couple of years. I had no, like I just assumed eventually we'll get busy doing other things and we won't be able to keep it up. Um, so like, it's amazing that it's, that it's like succeeded this far and that we're continuing with it, but it's not something that I expected. Um, and the same way with our world in data, I, I knew of, um, Max Rizer and Hannah Ritchie from Twitter and I met them in person. Um, and I was obviously a huge fan of our world in data, um, before I'd met them as well. Um, but they kind of co contacted me from, uh, because of my writing on COVID, um, research on COVID and like asked if I was interested in trying out something uh, like a small project with them at first um, before we decided to work together more. Um, but again, like that was not part of the plan. Like that was just this amazing thing that happened um, without me really looking for it. Yeah, I think that's cool. I think there's a, I think what you're sharing is like two pieces of the world. One of which is like, a, the classic like dog fooding slash, um, you could call it dog fooding. You could also call it um, schlep blindness and things like that, where you're like, what you're doing is, and you just, you, you're you annoyed with the world in various ways. And you're like, why is the news sharing this random site that has no backing of anything? It's like, no, it's not going to solve Alzheimer's people, like, or whatever. And so I think that, so you see that and then you're just like, let's like, I want to do something about it. And you're just, mm -hmm. you're doing that because you care about the problem and because you're no bad and you want things to be better and you're not doing it because you're like oh man maybe eventually this will be picked up by stripe or it's like no 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 no. you just are doing things that you think are would be helpful um and i think the other piece of it is kind of a um do you know like the micro mort perspective or the micro marriage perspective not really what, what is that um it's it's just it's a frame from the ea adjacent world which is like a micro mort it's kind of like did you use micro covid by the way the what the website Oh, I, I yeah, I did use that. Um, yeah, so yeah, my old house kind of created that. And I think it's this idea of micro morts, which is like if you go out and you like jump from planes a lot, maybe you, you get a lot of micro morts from that. You're not going to die necessarily, but your odds are kind of mm -hmm. it's a micro one micro mort is well, one in one million chance of dying. And so, and right. then a uh, micro COVID is a one in one million chance of getting COVID. And so you can like move through the world going, oh, outdoors is a 20x less uh, micro COVIDs than indoors, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then also for, but you can, those are for negative things. You can also flip it for positive things like micro marriages. And you can say, oh, a micro marriage is like just putting yourself out there and like being around cool men or women or whatever that you like. And so um, I think you have a similar perspective with the like our world and data story makes me think of that where you're just like, you're just out there and you're just like, yeah, I'll just have, like, I like these folks. I'll DM on Twitter, I'll hang out, whatever. And then like eventually it might show up into something, but you're just kind of increasing your surface area of micro luck. And then mm -hmm. it turns into stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just kind of amazed that any of this happened. Like I look back and think, how did I even... How did I even get here? I have no idea. And who knows where you'll be in, in 40 years. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to ask a question about, so I think there's an interesting piece on, I don't know, like, well, one thing, I guess there's two things I want to ask about here. One of them is on the, like, the, you're, you know, being frustrated with um, the way that society talks about science generally. And I'm reminded of like, um, uh, a recent or like six months ago, maybe in a piece on Alzheimer's and there were these two new Alzheimer's drugs that come out or blah. I was like, oh, this is so exciting. But I didn't really know if they were actually, cause I'm not really deep in that world. And so mm -hmm. what I did is I just went to, and I luckily I just went to Derek Lowe. Do you know Derek Lowe? Oh, um, yeah. I went to Derek Lowe's site and he wrote an amazing thing about him. He said, look, here's these couple new studies. Here's what's actually happening. And I just thought that that was, it was like, oh, I felt so much safer because actually mm -hmm. knowing whether it's going to be important or not important. How do you... I don't know, like, like if you think about the future of what this should look like and how science communication should be done, how should hashtag SciComm be done in 20 years or whatever? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, 
I feel like I should think about this more before answering. But so Derek Lowe, for example, is such a great example of someone who is really good at understanding the literature and then explaining it to a larger audience. Um, and I think there are also, there are lots of science journalists and writers who do that very well as well, but it's just, it's rare to find them. And it's also hard when you're just bombarded with lots of stuff in the news that doesn't come from just these high quality sources. So I really like stat news, for example. Um, and I think, I think maybe one of the, um, key things is having people who write for these outlets have some knowledge of statistics and like how research is actually conducted. So being able to spot a poor quality um, study or kind of maybe even just talking to different experts in the area that could help. I think lots of writers already do this. Um, But I think what's, what's like not very good about a lot of uh, science reporting is that a lot of it is just how can I excite this reader by showing them the biggest, coolest thing I've just heard about, even if I know nothing about the subject. Um, And that seems very dangerous to me. So I, I like with this newsletter, for example, I'm very reluctant to write about topics that I don't know very much about. Um, I'm also like, I should only really look at studies that I've, thought about or like mulled over for a few days. Maybe I should wait for other people to chime in on what they think of them um, and so on. So one example even was in this newsletter post that I did today. So um, there was this recent paper about the Black Death. Um, And so the Black Death is caused by this um, bacterium. And even though it was clear which bacterium caused the Black Death, it wasn't really known where the Black Death actually began. So it was thought to be somewhere in Central Asia or Europe or maybe in Western Asia, or, you know, it was just like not very clear. Um, and recently there was this new paper in Nature about, um, about this finding that there were people in a cemetery in Kyrgyzstan who had samples of this same bacterium that you could trace as being the um, ancestors of all Black Death virus samples today. And I was like, that seems pretty cool. Like, what a great finding, like, to finally um, hone in on that. And then it turns out that it's actually not very clear. So, like, this sample that they found, it was just a few people from from these two cemeteries. They didn't really... Uh, use like high quality um, genetic sequencing to look at this analysis um, and so on. And so it's like, even though it's published in nature and it seems like a really cool finding and it seems kind of intuitive that like, okay, this seems to have started here just a few years before the Black Death. That kind of makes sense. Um, It just wasn't reported very well in the news. Um, And it's, it's really hard to get that right when you're doing um, kind of reports on very recent studies. So, like, I'm like, if I get something wrong, I really want people to make sure that I know about that so that I don't misinform other people. Um, but it's really hard to get the balance right between sharing stuff that's interesting, sharing stuff that's in the news, and also being very um, careful about what you're saying. Yeah, that's interesting. I think that there's, I mean, I think in part of what you're saying, well, I, I do think, I mean, if you imagine, I do think from a, from a non, from an anti cheems mindset, I do think that if we imagine the world in 2040, it can actually be a happy world where, where, there, where the studies that are shared with the general public are things that have gone through a friction adjacent um, kind of scientific method thing where you have the study gets put out and back in the day, you should just be like, oh, it's in nature. Okay. Then mm-hmm. therefore you can put it in whatever, and and I don't I don't know that much about the peer review process and nature and all this stuff, but I think um, there's that. But then there's the distributed peer review where it's like, oh, there's this amazing critical. I'm looking at your article now. There's an amazing critical Twitter thread that is saying, hey, yes, but also blah 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 blah. And so I think you can have you can imagine a thing that gets baked over here, and then it eventually goes out into the world, and then over the course of I don't know, three months and people kind of vibing on it in these like a sub niche community, then Mm -hmm. it can actually say, okay, this thing actually does get 
is allowed to be sh shared with the public in this way. And the way it should be shared likely is, and I'm, I'm thinking about like 538 and ABC, how they have a, a collaboration. I think that's good because you just get Nate Silver to come on sometimes and be like, hey, people, it's a 30% chance that Trump gets elected because blah, blah, blah. We actually have the, side, the, the statistics to right. back it up. And so I'm imagining someone like Derek Lowe. It's like when the orgs, the, the mass media folks, that they are only quote unquote allowed to, I don't know, there's there's something about teachers here and like teacher influencers and being like, it's okay for us to use Derek Lowe and, and other, and there's probably a mm -hmm. hundred other people maybe like that, but like we shouldn't necessarily use the next a thousand because like there's these amazing teachers and so let's just like pull stuff from them and then have, and share that with the people. What what do you think about that? Like, is that- Yeah, I, that I honestly learned so much from people on Twitter and people like bloggers who are scientists and so on. Like, um. There's also this recent, um, there's this, there's this website called virological.org and they have like lots of interesting research published on various like infectious diseases and viruses and stuff like that. And it's not like a publication, but it's only really used by experts in the field. And all of the recent stuff on like monkeypox, for example, lots of research on COVID, was published there first and it was like experts talking to each other in public on this blog where you could see how they were critical about each other's findings but kind of just made suggestions of like this doesn't really make sense are you sure you did this analysis correctly and it was this kind of like live process whereas a lot of scientific publication is not like that at all so we'll have like people doing research on their own for a year, maybe two years. And then they go through a peer review process where like two or three other scientists see it, decide whether it should be published and then it gets published. And then it's like the final word on the topic, which is so bizarre. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I, I appreciate this other version of things so much more just to see people to see experts discussing things in real time and then coming to a conclusion about it yeah i love it and it looks like that site i went to virological.org it's just a discourse server you know it's just like mm -hmm. it's a discourse forum just kind of like uh, eth.research which is where people talk about eth um ethereum stuff and it's just like mm -hmm. and then they have up here in january of 2020 they're sequencing the SARS, you know, um, in COV-19 genomes, you know, and they're, right. they had a long discussion there in a serious way as and before it was getting out into the public. And so, yeah, that seems, things like that seem like a, a great home, a great shelling point for these folks. Yeah, Do you think it kind of blows mm -hmm. my mind. Sorry, just to interrupt. Like, yeah. it just yeah. really blows my mind that, like, these people also exist in real life and, like, on Twitter. So, for example, the... Um, the first genome sequence of uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus was posted on this blog. Um, and then also like the RSV vaccine that I mentioned, that some of the researchers who developed that like are also active on Twitter and stuff like that. And you can like meet them in person. And it's just like, this is insane. We get to see, we get to hear people's opinions in real time on these like really important issues that affect thousands or like millions of people um, and we don't really make use of that in the current academic publishing system yeah totally they're almost kind of like two and there's been like some studies about like if you post on twitter how that connects to the amount of like to like um h index stuff and whatever but i think that there's or but i think that there's like yeah, I agree that there's there needs to be some more deep interlinking there in a positive way. I also, for us, this is a nitpick, but I, I like I don't want to call virological a blog. I want to call it a mm -hmm. forum. You know okay, what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's a better <laughs> name. I just couldn't think of like what to call it. No, totally, totally. Um, the, the question I want to ask you is, what do you think about? So, so the way that you kind of you know what you've done with you know works in progress, I think is a really cool curation and synthesis of um great people talking about important things how do you what what kinds of how did you do that process and both the like finding the people finding the topics mm -hmm. and then like editing it yeah great question so it's kind of a mix of various different things so sometimes we uh we know people who are great writers maybe they're bloggers or they've written a book that we all love um and we just want them to write something and then the challenge is trying to think of a unique thing that they could write for us. Um, 
So I'll give you an example. Um, this really great writer called um, Stéphane Guyenet. Um, he is he used to be a neuroscientist. Now he's a book author. He writes about um, diet research um, and neuroscience and how that kind of fits together. And we were big fans of his blog and his like writing and Twitter and all of that. Um, and we just thought, what is something that he could write about that he hasn't written about, written about before, but that's like something we want to know about that maybe he could kind of write about. Um, and what we settled on was um, the future of weight loss. So what kinds of obesity drugs exist now? Um, are they going to get better soon? Like, are there things that we can expect in the coming trials? Um, or like, where's that whole kind of world going? Um, because lots of people kind of focus on dietary restrictions. And obviously, some of those work, but they're also very difficult for other people to do because you have to maintain them over such a long period of time and you can easily relapse. Um, and so that was just a really interesting thing for us. So it's often that way around where we have this author and then we just want to think of the right thing uh, for them to write. And then sometimes it's the opposite direction where we have uh, we have some idea in mind, and then we have to think of, like, who's the best person to write about this topic? Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that, but nothing really comes to mind at the moment. My mind is kind of going blank. Um, but we also sometimes just get, like, pitches from really interesting people. Uh, so, for example... Um, there's this uh, researcher called Stuart Buck. Um, he pitched us with a great article um, on red teams and like kind of, I am trying to, I'm struggling to think of the right word for it, but it's kind of combative research uh, team. So when you are doing some kind of study and you want to know whether you're designing the study well or analyzing the results properly, um, could you just call on like a, a team of reviewers who will red team you. And I think that's like a DARPA term. So it's the term for a team of people who kind of combat the things you're saying and try to improve um, the content of your writing and research. And so that was yeah. like a really cool article as well. And it was just, you know, we didn't know Stuart Buck very well, but it was such a great idea for a piece and it turned out really well. That's cool. Yeah, I think it's so it's like, yeah, people first or content first or yeah, there's mm -hmm. people first. or there's just kind of like people first content first and then like, yeah, the open having open submissions. And I think it's interesting the like, yeah, I think that there are, I don't know, in the, in the red teaming thing is interesting. It makes me just think of like, um, you know, making science better, meta science stuff and how there are, um, you know, I'm thinking about what you were just talking about with virology.org and then what like Jonathan Haidt was doing with his some of his recent um uh, he was crowdsourced, you know, him and a collaborator put up a Google doc that had a bunch of data on how social media affects, you know, preteen women's health. And it like, mm -hmm. it's general. And, so, and then they said, Hey, this is all out there. We all have our, and he says the best way to beat, um, you know, confirmation bias is other people's con confirmation bias. That's the only way you can do it. So you got a red team right. on the other side or else you're just going to be in your own little bubble. So, um, that's just another amazing way that like modern day scientists, uh, or, or researchers, or academics are like using Google docs and Twitter to do stuff. Do you, mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so that makes sense. Let, let, I want I want to shift for a second. So I think I kind of, under, so you're kind of, you're going through the world, you're understanding, you're just kind of following your curiosity and the things that you find annoying about the stuff. And actually, <laughs> let me ask you, let me ask you a question about the COVID thing. Cause you know, I saw okay. some of your writings on, um, you know, unheard and the new statesman. And I just, I think about, and that all seems good. But then I think about like what happened in America and there's this great, I think a Vox video on how folks in America on the right fell down a meme plex, which is that they started with COVID happened. It was during Trump times. Trump was like, it's just the flu. And then, and that kind of just the flu thing got, and then, and then we did take a lot of aggressive mm -hmm. precautions or whatever. And so then people are like, it's overblown. And once you kind of place your little um, foot in the ground there and say, oh, it's, a, it's just the flu. It's a little bit overblown. Then as the rest of stuff is happening, as it gets more dangerous with Delta and whatever, and then mm -hmm. as, um, you know, and then people are like, oh, it's just the flu. And then you have, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people dying who just believe it's just the flu and literally on their deathbed, their kind of confirmation bias are, is still being like, right. it's not COVID or whatever. So how, I guess like, 
I don't know, we're talking about these like cool academic papers and blah, 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 but there's also just like how people's minds work and like the meme plexes that they fall into and can't get out of. Mm -hmm. How should, do you, do you think much about that side, how we can help on that side with like COVID reporting? Yeah, it's such a crazy thing. I was just reading this, um, this study actually about climate change and it was kind of similar in that it, like there's this very common finding in the literature that when you give people information, they tend to update in favor of that information. So if you give them a kind of fake news story, they slightly tend towards believing it on average, even if they don't haven't really thought about it or anything like that. And then you can kind of give them a fact check or a correction or something, and then they'll update in favor of the fact check and go like, okay, that, that makes sense. I was, I was wrong. Um, let me change my mind a little. And I think that's kind of what's happening with lots of COVID stuff as well. So the more information you give to people, it, it's kind of just a matter of what they're hearing. So if you give people the right information, they'll update in favor of the right information on average. But if they're hearing, if they're just on Fox News all the time and hearing these crazy stories about, I don't know, vaccines causing millions of deaths, then they might update in favor of that because that's that's the thing that's just, that's the thing they've just been hearing about. And when you're not like deep into the literature, um, you don't have time. I mean, no, no one really has the time to just be on Twitter all, all the time. Um, and it's just hard to keep up with all the latest with all the latest stuff, especially when it contradicts with each other, and you just don't know how to fit things together, especially if you're outside the field. Um, so it's not. I think it's that's not an excuse, but it's also not that surprising that people will kind of go in that direction because that's what they're hearing about. Yeah, I think, and that's. I mean. Well, that's an interesting study that if you get a little bit of info, you update towards it. But I think I feel like I've also heard the opposite, which is like that people, especially when you fall deep enough down a meme plex, like the folks who are in who are waiting for a UFO, they're in a cult. The UFO is supposed to show up tomorrow, you know, today it doesn't mm -hmm. show up. And then they, what they'll still do is be like, you know what? It's going to show up tomorrow or like there's, you know, they, they have like some kind of reasoning where they're like, oh, the Mayan calendar ball. No, it's it, mm -hmm. the, the number was wrong in 100 years. It's going to happen. So I think there is. So I kind of hear what you're saying, but I also feel like once you're deep down the rabbit hole enough, it's like you see anything else as a threat and yeah. you don't accept it. And I guess the thing that maybe I'd, I don't know if I'd push you on or something is like, I think that like I, I didn't I didn't go, actually go that deep on like your COVID reporting. But I think the stuff that you're doing is good and it's for a certain audience, which are these people who are kind of like extremely online Twitter folks or whatever. But then mm -hmm. I don't know, thinking about how these things, you know, back to the SciComm perspective and like how like how like how, how did we mess up covid reporting as a as a peoples and how could we actually make that information ecosystem better for them i, I yeah yeah that's a that's a great question <laughs> um i this is a very embarrassing now but i used to be very into the like libertarian movement and it was like i would kind of feel the same way as these like ufo cult people, which is not to say libertarians are like UFO cult people. Um, but I would sort of think that like anything that contradicted my worldview or like how I saw these pieces fitting together would mean that I'd have to let go of the whole thing altogether. And I was like, I would see that as a threat. So I'd see some new research and I'd be like, that can't be right. Because if that's right, then this other thing is also wrong that I believe and then I'd have to change my mind on that as well and I maybe I just don't want to do that and maybe I just don't believe it and there's something wrong with that study um yeah. and yeah and I think it it took a while but I eventually decided to just kind of let go and see where the research took me and not just kind of hold on to these values or principles of like how things fit together necessarily um and I think that's probably quite important just to realize that like things are really complicated there's no necessary reason that they'll all fit together in a certain way um and you know if you don't see if you're in a ufo cult and you don't see this ufo landing the next day um that doesn't mean you have to give up your whole belief in aliens forever but maybe it means that the person who told you the ufos were going to come tomorrow was wrong yeah and that's I, love that. like I think the way to start getting out of that i think 
Totally. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, and there's, I think it makes me think of like deprogramming generally and Megan Phelps and the Westboro Baptist Church and how, um, and I think that there's, and that's the way you get people out is not necessarily by shaming them, but providing them like an exit that is actually slightly positive, you know? And so, and this is kind of like the Putin, oh, do you want to like give Putin, um, yeah, like having people have an exit ramp, I think is helpful. And I think it's also just makes me think it's the most, one of the most crucial things that we could teach all our kids is just like pluralism and the scout mindset and to like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, keep your identity small or some combination of those things where you're just like, hey, it's okay if something comes in and it changes the way you see the world. And like, you were maybe more of a libertarian and now you kind of make, yeah, okay, government can be okay sometimes. And that's okay. You know, and so I, yeah, that, that seems powerful. I guess as we get into, we got like roughly five more minutes left and I want to ask you, Saloni, well, A, is there anything that we covered or anything that we didn't cover that you especially want to talk about? Hmm. Um, uh, well, maybe my stuff for our world and data. Um, yeah. So it's really exciting that like, um, I mean, again, amazing that I'm even working there. It's very confusing that this has all happened. Um, you deserve it, Saloni. You deserve <laughs> it. You deserve it. I believe in you. You deserve it. <laughs> um, so I, I've gradually been finding throughout the last few years that I just really enjoy learning about infectious diseases. Um, and so I think I think part of the reason for that is when I was um, doing my undergrad degree, I was like I found that kind of stuff fascinating. But I also um, studying biomedical science, for example, meant that like I started to understand a lot of the terminology that other people were that other people didn't and even as i continued into um genetics specifically um like i just kept i i was still able to like uh, keep in touch with all the you know the terms and the jargon and all of that um, and that meant reading the literature is a lot easier and so when covid struck it was just so much easier for me to catch on to the literature than it was for people who were, you know, in other fields or like autonomous or um, social sciences or whatever. Um, and that meant that like I had this weird position of having friends in lots of different fields, but then also being one of the few people that they knew who could understand the literature. Um, What's happening with really COVID right enjoyed... now, Saloni? Yeah. <laughs> and I really, I just really enjoyed like kind of explaining these these things that other experts were talking about to a kind of general audience. Um, And the same is true of like various other infectious diseases. So I've been reading lots of stuff about guinea worm disease, uh, which is super fascinating. Um, Just to summarize that it's this, um, it's this disease called that's caused by a parasitic worm called guinea worm. And right now it's found in four countries in Africa. Um, but it used to be common in South Asia and parts of Central Asia as well. And it's this like debilitating disease that is very disgusting and like shocking to actually think about. So it's this it's this uh, worm that lays eggs in um, ponds and lakes and things like that. Um, and so if you don't have access to drink like tap water or drinking water sources, you might decide you know, you're super thirsty and you drink from a stagnant pond. And these ponds are contaminated with the eggs of these worms. And so when you drink that water, these eggs get into your stomach and small intestines and they kind of crawl through uh, those organs and start growing into worms. And the worms just keep growing from there and like travel around your body Um, And they travel around your bones and joints. And you can imagine that like a worm growing in these joints actually really affects your normal functioning. Um, So in some people, it causes arthritic conditions. In some people, it just causes a lot of pain. And for about a year, these worms just keep growing until they eventually emerge from your skin and then slowly come out of your skin. Um, And then you feel so much pain from this emergence of this worm that you get this blister and you want to treat or you want to like relieve the pain from the blister. And so you might, you know, take a dip in the nearest pond or lake and that lets the the worms release their eggs again and the whole cycle restarts. So it's this shocking and devastating disease um, that's 
that's been around for maybe thousands of years. Um, and it's on the verge of being eradicated worldwide, um, which is really cool. Um, and so I've been reading about that, which is very exciting. That's awesome. Well, thank you for, I mean, in some ways I regret that I ever asked you the question, you know, and, like, and then I, and then I Googled Guinea worm disease and now I'm looking at the mm -hmm. Google images of all these um, worms coming out of people's, you know, legs, but it is, um, uh, that's it. I mean, that's interesting. It's interesting to hear how the cycle repeats and it's cool that, um, yeah, you have this kind of like a funny word for it might be fetish, you know, like for infectious diseases. Like, how does this work? And blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, yeah. it, it, it reminds me of my mom who used to, um, uh, organize medical conferences and one of them that she would do is the genetics conference and they would have this um they called it i forget what they they called it but um diagnostic dilemmas and it would bring all these folks from it would bring all these geneticists and they would it was they'd liquor them up on like a friday night like the last night of the the event or whatever and they'd bring them all in this room and then people would come up and show these really weird um and i went to one of them and they'd show like their issues that they were having and so they're like hey here's this person they have three feet you know, and like, here's what we looked at. We look at this, we look at the other thing and the crowd is kind of like hooping. I don't know, the crowd, but they're, mm -hmm. they're also treating it as like a very interesting, like, cause they're all scientists. Like, oh, right. did you try out this? Or have you, you know, sequenced their exome and blah, 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 blah. And so it's just, it was a really interesting uh, thing. It, it, your perspective slightly reminds me of that. Uh, so as, yeah. a, as a wrap, I want to ask, uh, let's do three quick overrated, underrated. Uh, the first one okay. is, do you think meta science and, you know, no more than 15 seconds on each or do you think meta science mm -hmm. is overrated or underrated? Ooh. Um, I think it's very underrated by the public. Among my friends, I feel like it's slightly overrated. So I like the abstract, like thinking about how science works and stuff like that. But I also feel like we do need to talk about the really cool, great stuff that we have uh, discovered through science. Um, and that stuff is generally not meta science. It's it's the nitty gritty details or how to create a vaccine, things like that. Yep, love it. Um, what about is what about getting a PhD? Is that overrated or underrated? Ooh. Hmm. Well, I feel like there are so many different reasons that you might get a PhD. So. Uh, obviously, if you're very interested in the subject and you want to make a difference in that area, um, it's definitely underrated. Um, I feel like it's overrated in terms of, um, well, I guess if you're if you're still figuring out what you want to do with your life, you shouldn't do a PhD, which is something I wish I had known. Um, but I I still really enjoyed it because it was like you learn about all of these different methods and tools and lots of other people in the department, for example, are really fun to talk to. Um, and so it's, it's a great experience for that. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. But yeah, if you, if you don't know necessarily, maybe do some learning before you go deep. Uh, is, yeah. And then finally is Twitter overrated or underrated? Twitter is extremely underrated. I think um, again, for the same reason that I mentioned before, of just like yeah. we get to, see all of these people who really know their stuff talking to each other live like that's that's not something you can really get from any other platform it's crazy you can both see what like you know like jay-z or barack obama is saying which is fun <laughs> in its own way but it's also you mm -hmm. get to actually say like oh here's this amazing um web3 crypto economics researcher here's this amazing you know like um you know epi twitter here's what you know epidemiology mm -hmm. twitter saying oh my god um yes yeah, so everybody shill get on twitter it's great and yeah. with that note i love um, when people are like arguing with each other on twitter because i learned so much from it. yes and she's these random really important people arguing in like the replies mm -hmm. of something where they're like hey but i think this and you think that, oh i misunderstood yeah. you here whatever so yeah that's great um so as we wrap here a um if you want to check out um saloni stuff uh she is on twitter at salonium s-a-l-o-n-i saloni her name and then um salonium um mm -hmm. and then you can also check out go to our world data if you want to learn about our world and data um check out works in progress magazine works in progress.co um and then check out um her new uh sub stack um which looks awesome as well and it's her pinned tweet on her twitter any final things you want to say saloni Ooh, not at all um hmm I guess have a good weekend or week whenever this gets published. Exactly. Um, beautiful. Um, well, I agree. Um, people are people and our listeners are people and you're a person. So um, thank you for uh, chatting, Saloni. And then thank you listeners for listening. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks so much for listening today. 
If you like the show, please give us a five-star podcast review or subscribe on YouTube. And if you'd like to chat about this episode with a community of amazing, smart, ambitious, divergent people, come on by and join our Discord. You can find it at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. And then finally, if you'd like to contribute to these ideas being shared more widely in society, you can support the podcast production team at patreon.com slash Reese Lindmark. That's patreon.com slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, and see you here for the next episode. Bye.